Hi there, my name is Amber. I chose the unit on biofuels and land use change just based on the fact that I really didn't know much about it and the agricultural side of things really piqued my curiosity. Hello, my name is Christopher Murphy and I chose biofuels and land use changes uh, simply because I just want to make the world a better place for the generations after us and I was looking at going into an, a field uh, to focus on sustainability for other various companies to just make the world a little bit cleaner. Well, hello there. My name is Kayla Garbush. What brings me here today is because my group and I have a common understanding of wanting to save the world. First off, I would like to bring you to the topic that we have chosen. We have chosen the topic of biofuels and land use changes. We have chosen this talk, but due to having the common understanding that we need change and we need to stop relying solely on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are used for things like what goes into this, what heats your house, and everything else that is used with fossil fuels. Now, there's something that is called biofuels, which is made from corn. This is a cash crop that could change the world and eventually hopefully eliminate if not help lower the carbon emissions that we release into the air with our greenhouse gases stay tuned and see what everybody else has in store thank you so now we're going to jump into the history behind biofuels one would likely assume that the history of biofuels is relatively new mostly as a realization to the fact that fossil fuels are non-renewable and a very limited resource. But this actually isn't the case at all. Biofuels were first discovered before petroleum. Prior to the 1830s, whale oil was the primary fuel used in lamps. This unfortunately was very expensive and that made it pretty unobtainable for anybody who wasn't in the higher class society. So then enter the invention of the first biofuel turpentine. After the invention of the internal combustion engine, our reliance on fuel skyrocketed to the point that we needed more. So then enter biofuels. The stakeholders. The first stakeholder I would like to talk about is the landowners. Finding where these feedstocks are going to be grown, which pre-existing land is going to be used or replaced. They value the land and want it to remain the same, if not in better working condition than it was before. They also are looking for a profitable income. Farmers. Keeping up with the demand of the crops, such as corn, to keep up with the fuel and food demands. They value the land and want to ensure to keep the land in a proper working manner Ensuring the land and the soil is getting proper nutrients to grow good crop. They value good working conditions, proper wages for the hard work and effort put into managing these farmlands, along with putting out good product for the consumers, which brings me to the consumer. With the higher demand in our food, such as corn source, the higher prices we will pay for these crops. Consumers value a good sale or more bang for their buck. More importantly, they value good product. This is what we consume and this is what we feed our families. We the consumers rely on good wholesome foods. Businesses. Keeping up with the consumer supply and demands needs. Selling good, wholesome, safe products for consumers to make a profitable income providing job security for the workers and growth within their businesses. Lastly, the government. The government is looking to meet their main goal, which is keeping the economic flow with growth and development. They are trying to find ways to become more energy independent by finding other alternatives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions without disturbing the economy. By doing so, they value businesses' growth along with trading. This provides jobs and job security.
Huge fuel shortages in World War II created an intense frenzy to find an alternative to the costly ethanol. The first patents for large-scale production of biofuels passed in the late 1950s and early 1960s. In 1973, an oil embargo that focused on the export of petroleum caused the already steep price of ethanol to jump even higher. Within the last 20 years, there has been a growing concern on climate change caused by carbon emissions. This led to an increased interest in any alternative fuel source, including biofuels. This interest has created three generations of technology in types of biofuels. Generation one biofuels consist of biofuels made from sugar crops, such as sugarcane and sugar beets, starch crops, mostly consisting of corn, oil seed crops like soybeans and canola, and animal fats. The sugar and starch crops are fermented into ethanol, butanol, and propanol, whereas oil seed crops and animal fats are processed into biodiesel. Biodiesel, derived from cornstarch, reduces emissions by 20%. Generation 2 biofuels are derived from cellulose, which is more sustainable than Generation 1 because they are made from bio-waste like corn cobs, straw, wood, and wood byproducts. Generation 2 biofuels reduce emission by 50%. Generation 3 biofuel research began in 2013 and is still in development. The weight will be worth it though, as these biofuels will be made from algae and will be anywhere from 10 to 100 times more productive than traditional crops. Generation 3 biofuels are predicted to reduce emissions by 60%. There are government policies in place too, drive research, development, and implementation. The Energy Policy Act of 2005 promotes research and development with tax cuts, grants, and subsidies. It also establishes a renewable fuel standard mandating of 7.5 billion gallons of renewable fuels by 2012. The Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 builds upon the Policy Act of 2005 with similar incentives, but pushes the mandating to 36 billion gallons by 2022. 20 bu 21 billion of which must be cellulose biofuels or advanced biofuels from other sources other than cornstarch and bio refineries must replace 80% of oil refineries. Let's talk about the positive impacts of biofuels. Producing biofuels locally reduces dependence on unstable oil producing countries. With less dependence on fossil fuels, the demand falls, which drives the price of these products down. This drop in price allows consumers to spend that money elsewhere, boosting the economy. Generation two and three biofuels do not need any land use changes because they use bio waste normally thrown away. This reduces the need for new crops to be planted just for fuel production. Biofuel production operates on an almost infinite loop, whereas there is only a limited supply of oil and once it is used up, it is all gone. Biofuel production also increases income in small third world countries by giving them something to grow and sell and diversifying their economies. Although biofuels have the potential to reduce our carbon footprint, there are still some negative impacts that must be dealt with. When land use is changed to make new biofuel crops, the carbon trapped in the vegetation and soil is released into the air. The carbon emissions released during land use change can be as damaging, if not more, than using fossil fuels. There is also a loss of biodiversity. Forests, grasslands, and other natural habitats are destroyed when more farmlands are created. This increase in demand for bio crops dramatically increases the consumer prices of those goods. Corn has seen a price increase from five to 53% in the last few years because of this increase in demand. Also, the benefits of using and producing biofuels is dependent on the reduction of fossil fuel use at the same time. So our first driver behind biofuels is going to be supply and demand. This one is pretty self-explanatory just based on the fact that we have such a high demand for fuel in general. This is obviously going to convert right over into a high demand for biofuels. The issue with this then becomes is where are we growing this? The land has to come from somewhere. So this is 
then creating this high demand for land. And because of this, crop prices grow up. So we have this really interesting ripple effect going on where it's a vicious circle. An example of this would be soybean production. So in the U.S., after biofuels became really popular, there was this huge demand for corn production. This then increased soybean prices worldwide because the U.S. wasn't exporting soybeans anymore. It was then growing corn. So then places like Brazil started to plant soybeans. And unfortunately, they only have a limited number of space as well. So what ended up happening is they started clearing these Brazilian forests to make up for the lost pastures. And unfortunately, those pastures were originally used to grow crops for beef agriculture. So then this then increased not only the price of soybean from the U.S., but also beef in general because we lost that pasture use. The second driver is going to be energy security. So the first part of energy security is going to be a fuel scarcity. This is just like we just talked about earlier about how there's a huge demand for fuel, but a low, limited quantity of it. So it's a scarce resource. On top of that, we have a bit of a lack of investment happening. So we haven't really invested all that much into other renewable resources. So then that drives the need for biofuels because we can use a lot of the same technology that we use for fuel for biofuels. So we can use the same gas stations for storage and pumping. We can use the same cars. Our next one is going to be technology or infrastructure failures. So one thing we really need to think about here is the BP oil spill, how that completely halted the drilling of offshore oil facilities. This drove up the price of oil because, again, the demand was higher in comparison to the supply. So here we have to think of the quote from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Our last indirect driver behind energy security is going to be terrorism. So because the, again, demand for fuel is so great, there comes some vulnerability, especially with how our infrastructure is set up now. Just think of how our pipelines and storage facilities are completely out in the open. This makes them vulnerable. We can even see these acts of terrorism happening today with Iran attacking some British oil tankers recently. So now we're just going to continue on with our direct drivers for biofuel use. Our third one is going to be a concern with greenhouse gases and climate change. At this point, it's pretty apparent on both a personal and international level that climate change is occurring and how we can greatly affect that and reduce that is going to be through our greenhouse gas emissions. So here we have listed just a few examples of the international ones. So we have the Kyoto Protocol, the Cancun Agreements, and the Copenhagen Conference. All of these are on international levels. Then on some personal actions would be like taking a subway to work or carpooling and stuff like that. Our last and final direct driver for biofuel use is going to be economic development. So the first one, the first indirect driver for this is going to be industrialization. So energy transitions and industrialization go hand in hand. It's typically an invention of some sort that will cause a strong reliance behind an energy source. So think of the internal combustion engine and how that has led to cars and boats and airplanes. This really drove our societal need for oil and bolstered our economy. Another one is going to be developing nations. So in many developing countries, access to energy sources is rare. So it, it is in these same countries where we can expect a growth in the agriculture of biofuels. Mostly that's because it's pretty top dollar to pay for these. And this is going to cause some economic growth and rural development in these developing nations just based on an increase in income. Another one is going to be agriculture. So specifically in the U.S., 
and overproduction of agriculture led to this interest in using crops for fuel, specifically corn. There has also been grants and tax breaks given to farmers as incentives to the crops necessary for biofuels.